My name is Allison Holleran. I'm the Executive Director of Audubon Rockies. I've been invited to talk today about a little bit about birds and river health. And so I thought before I'd actually launch into how birds indicate for a healthy ecosystem, I would actually give you a little bit of background on Audubon. Sometimes I get up to give talks and people are not familiar with Audubon and think that we are about a, a highway in Germany. <laughs> We're not. <laughs> Next slide. Or can you? We are actually a bird conservation organization. We consider ourselves the voice for birds. <clears throat> and birds really lead us to our work. We let them tell us where we need to go and what we need to do. Next slide, please. The National Audubon Society has been around the block a time or two, let's say. We are 109 years old. We were actually established in 1905. Am I in the way of anyone? I have like a little movement problem. I like to walk around, like Vanna White, too. Hey. <laughs> um, <laughs> we were actually called the National Association of Audubon Societies for the Protection of Wild Burble Birds and Mammals. Thank God someone had the sense to shorten it to the National Audubon Society. And it was actually, we began in response to the slaughter of birds for fashion, for their plumage, for hats, purses, you name it. Um, and it was actually started by a group of women. <clears throat> <Woo -hoo. laughs> Over the 109 years, we've accomplished quite a bit. Basically, starting early, we passed the Audubon, Audubon Plumage Law in 1910 in response to the slaughter of those birds. We helped pass the Migratory Bird Treaty Act in 1918, and we created the very first two bird sanctuaries, one being the Teddy Roosevelt Sanctuary in New York, and the other the Paul J. Rainy Sanctuary in coastal Louisiana, which are still in the works today. So I work for Audubon Rockies, and there's sometimes some confusion about who is who. I am an employee of the National Audubon Society. My paycheck actually comes from New York City, where our headquarters are, believe it or not. But we are a regional office of, so we carry the mission of National Audubon. We see that we are in the same, uh, al aligned with the mission and goals, but we work on our initiatives as well. So <clears throat> Audubon Rockies was actually uh, combined offices of Colorado and Wyoming in 2011. Audubon Colorado was a state office for a very long time, and so was Audubon Wyoming, but we were working in very similar tracks as far as policy, science, and education, and fiscally, it made a lot of sense. We're both very small offices, and when it came down to the bottom line, we said, let's combine the offices, save some money, and do the work we were meant to do. So Audubon Rockies was actually born in 2011. Our regional office is located in Fort Collins, Colorado, in beautiful historical downtown. I like to go. We accomplish our mission through policy, science, and education, a three-pronged approach. Our mission that we accomplish through policy, science, and education is to be a strong, unified voice for the ethic of conservation in the Rockies, focusing on birds, yes, we are Audubon, but we also focus on wildlife and their habitats for the benefit of future generations. Next. Now I mentioned science policy education. <clears throat> I think one, things that, one thing that makes Audubon unique is that we really use science to inform our policy and education efforts. So what science tells us is what we push forward. If you just have science alone, you're just doing science for science. And there's no real value in it, in my opinion. I'm a scientist. I, that's my background. That's where I come from. But if you're not going to use it, What's it worth? And on the flip side of things, if you have policy and education and you're not using science, you may very well be making misinformed decisions. So we let science drive our efforts. Next. So what are our initiatives? Three of the big ones right now are Western Rivers, our Western Rivers Initiative, which I'm going to focus on today, obviously. We're talking about water. We also have a sagebrush initiative and an Audubon at Home, which encompasses a lot of our, hello, our education, um, habitat heroes and things like that. Next. What we are not. <laughs> We're not a bird watcher organization. We are. I love to watch birds. I don't have a life list, no. But birds are very important. But again, we focus landscape scale conservation 
through the lens of birds. Everyone likes to watch birds, but what are we going to do to conserve them? Next. All right. Now let's get down to the nitty gritty. All righty, next. Birds of ecosystem health. Birds are a great indicator. All birds need water. I don't care if you're a willow flycatcher, like the bird you see on the right, or a greater sage grouse, that one on the left. Upland game bird, very dry habitat, as you know. They still need water. Next. Birds are also very tied to rivers. There are over 300 of our species in Colorado are dependent at some point in their life cycle on our river ecosystems. At some point. They're not all obligates, which meaning they have to have water at all times of their life cycle. At some point. That means breeding, migration, overwintering. And a long time ago, in 1977, it actually doesn't seem like a very long time ago. <laughs> that, I know, <laughs> dates me, right? Um, a study sh showed that riparian habitats contained up to 10 times more biodiversity than our dry uplands. That does not mean we discount our dry uplands, but it just shows that dependency on water that our avian species have and many other species, as you might, might well guess. Go ahead. <clears throat> There's a lot of reliance on rivers. As we are relied on rivers, as far as Boulder is sitting where? Probably because it runs right next to water. Many of our to towns and rivers are associated with rivers and wetlands. Riparian habitats are especially important to insectivorous birds, you know, birds that eat bugs. Um, they're critical to breeding birds, like I said, and less than 1% of the United States landscape consists of riparian vegetation since 1998. So it's a very small habitat type covering a little bit of land, especially in the arid west, but one that holds a ton of diversity. Go ahead. 51, over half, 51% of our breeding birds <coughs> count on these riparian areas during their breeding season. 51%. It's over half of our species. And in 1977, it was seen that we've lost, uh, uh, the loss of southwestern riparian vegetation could result in 78 to over 150 bird species. So the more we kind of whittle it down, the more species we're going to lose. Next. <clears throat> so in the last 150 years, it's been uh, estimated, just as an example in Utah, that Utah's lost 80 to 95 percent of their riparian habitat. That's just Utah. It, I'm, I, I'm a happy, happy face in this crowd, aren't I? I'm just presenting all the good things. <clears throat> so. As we think about it, as we, again, whittle down our riparian habitats, the ones that we have left are very, very precious to us today. And we need to conserve them, as you all sitting here know. Next. So bringing it back, and that res resonates with people outside of the environmental community, I do this because I feel very strongly about conservation and having a landscape that I want my children to see just as I saw when I was you know, my age and younger, or better. But a lot of people don't get that connection between the environment and themselves. It's a direct connection to our health. So if you're ever in an argument with someone and they're like, oh, I mean, I had been into an argument where someone said, who cares about that stupid duck, quote, unquote. Who cares if it goes extinct? And I said, well, you better care because you have grandchildren, and they are a direct indicator to how they will be living healthily or not in the future. They're indicators of our health. They indicate the water quality, the water quantity. So if we have healthy habitats, we have healthy ecosystems, we have healthy people. And that is a connection I think that most of the populace can understand and see. Go ahead. So threats to rivers. <clears throat> I started this and went down my list and it was taking a long time and I was getting really depressed. So I just kind of made it very general. There are many, many threats to rivers, as many we could spend all day sitting here thinking of them. But in general, these are the biggies I think about. Overallocation, something you guys are talking about very much today. Demand exceeding supply, and we're looking right down the barrel of that with the expansion of the Front Range in the next 10 to 20 years. Diversions, 
example of that is the 60% of the Frasier is diverted to the front range. So we can turn on our taps. Pollution and contaminants, talking oil and gas. I know you guys are having a panel on fracking. That should be good and interesting, and I'm going to leave that to them. Herbicides, pesticides, those type of things, all that pollutes our waters. Even, you know, as you take your medication and flush the toilet, your extra medication goes right into the groundwater and cannot be filtered out. And litter, you know, we see a lot of litter around our, our waterways. Lots of people use them, lots of people recreate in them, not everyone takes care of them. This is not a good fashion statement for a bird, it has a, it's actually covered in a plastic bag. Next. <clears throat> and be, a big one also is climate change. Mm. Something that we can't deny, I think something that our Senate is trying to deny very hard right now, but it's here, and we're looking at it. We're looking at it right now. This is um, uh, a model that National Audubon is working on. They're modeling over 100 species. This is just an example. This is yellow warbler, very common riparian bird. These are scenarios, so this is low emissions, medium, high emissions, and then it goes across as years go by and how the yellow warbler's range is going to change. So if the yellow warbler's range is going to change, what's going to happen to us in our water supply? They could be very telling. And a very common species. You wouldn't think yellow warbler might be a really good indicator of what's going to happen. But that's what I'm about to talk to you next. Go ahead. The way we function now, generally as humans, and, but really and truly, in the NGO community, in the environmental community, we're very reactive. Something happens, we throw up our hands, we say, oh no, what are we going to do about it? And we react. We run to a spill in the Gulf. Why didn't we prevent that spill in the Gulf? What can we do as a community to say, we need to th start thinking, proactively instead of reactively. Because if we're always on the reactive, we're just treading water. And that's what Audubon has really come to. Next. We're using focal species, like I said, to move policy and education and science. So we're really letting, like I began the, the presentation, we let birds kind of move us in the direction that we should go. This is what we're doing here. I brought up the example of yellow warbler. Very common species, no one would think, oh, that's a good indicator, or maybe we should pay attention to that bird versus southwest willow flycatcher, which is a very endangered bird. So we are using some unusual focal species to move our policy forward and become more proactive and to figure out what we can do on the front end before it gets away from us. Next. I'll give you an example of this, and this goes back to our sagebrush initiative. And the reason why I'm giving you this example is we've been working on the sagebrush initiative for almost a decade. <clears throat> Western Rivers, we've been in it for two years. We've always worked in rivers, but we, till we formalized a really solid initiative was two years back. The sagebrush initiative, ecosystem initi initiative, we use the greater sage grouse as a focal species. We chose one bird, one bird. But it was never about the greater sage grouse. It was never about saving that bird. This bird was chosen as our flagship because it represented an entire ecosystem and did it well. How do we make the choice for greater sage grouse? Three big issues. It is a keystone species or a sagebrush obligate, meaning that it does not truly migrate. It is dependent on sagebrush 365 days a year. Different aspects of the sagebrush habitat for sure during the year, but nonetheless in the sagebrush all year long. I'm going to switch these two. ESA, Endangered Species Act. This was a political lever we felt we could use well. And I will give you a warning about this. Everyone loves the Endangered Species Act, right? Because then you have a hammer to hold over someone's head and say, if you don't do this, your business is gone, your livelihood is gone, and that can be really good. And in this situation, it worked well and is working well because the uh, greater sage grouse is up for listing again, potential listing in 2015. If you didn't know, it'll be coming up. Um, <clears throat> however, 
the ESA is always in peril of pretty much being diminished or taken off the books. So we have to be, as a community, very careful of how we wield the Endangered Species Act because it is a very strong act and we want to protect that as well and not use it willy-nilly and sue over everything. We have to be really strategic. And because it was an, an ESA candidate, there was some money following the sage grouse. And to do an initiative and a grassroots initiative and to move policy well, sorry, but you got to have some funding behind you. So we tapped into all of that. But really and truly, the science told us that if we can conserve the greater sage grouse, we're going to conserve an ecosystem. Next. And we've had some really great success. The war has only begun. It's not over. We have a long way to go. But nonetheless, we've kind of proven this focal species model is maybe a, a, a good avenue to go. Through our core area plan in Wyoming, where I started, we've protected 15 million acres of sagebrush. That otherwise pretty much would have been either burned, spiked, or drilled. We're using this same plan, this core area plan identifying the most critical areas for sage grouse, and we're trying to take it to the other 10 states that have sagebrush, sage grouse. And if we're successful there, which we're on that road, we'll look at 60 million plus acres across the West. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. So Audubon, in Wyoming specifically, Audubon um, got on the sage, uh, the sage grouse task force, which was put together by Governor Friedenthal. And on that task force, we were the, um, one of the only NGOs on that task force. It is Wyoming, after all. Um, industry was part of it, uh, um, federal agencies, um, and some private landowners. And in, on that committee, they basically identified those core areas that they thought held, and it was done by LEC data. So we looked at the most concentrated areas for sage grouse and drew concentric circles out from there so that we could protect as much as we could. There was certainly not Audubon getting everything we wanted. Not by a long shot. But we got a lot. We got a lot. And so, <clears throat> now that we're working, we work with a lot of other groups trying to push it in the other states because we are only in Wyoming and Colorado, Audubon Rockies. So we're working with other Audubon organizations. We're working with a lot of other NGOs to press for the other 60 million. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, let me start with the latter. Spike is an herbicide, <clears throat> and it's a pellet herbit herbicide, so they can put it in the ground, and it basically kills sagebrush. It's sele it selectively um, kills, and I think the half-life is a long time, a long time. It has been used for that, mm-hmm. Not, ex not exclusively cattle grazing. There's many reasons people use spike. And for a long time in the West, people really looked at sagebrush as a scourge. You know, ooh, sagebrush, what good is it? Can't graze in it, can't, you know, recreate in it. Let's get rid of it. Um, as far as burning, <clears throat> there are over 15 species of sagebrush. Some sagebrush species that are the wetter and I use that term loosely, wetter species of sagebrush, <coughs> can put up with a little bit of burning. Mostly our Wyoming big and our other species of sagebrush are not a codependent fire species, meaning that when you burn a grassland, grasslands are dependent on fire. They need fire in order to regenerate. It's a natural cycle. It is not typically in the sagebrush steppe ecosystem. However, like spike, in order to kind of cut back the sagebrush or get rid of it entirely, burning has been used, and it's been used by private landowners and federal agencies alike, and continue to, to, um, to be used. Okay, next. So, <clears throat> with this focal species approach, we've kind of opened some new doors. Like you said, there are a lot of people working on this, and Audubon has worked with industry, with federal agencies, to, you know, sometimes we got a little called out on it and said, why are you working with industry? Well, because we have to. It's happening. You turn on your heat in the wintertime. You like your house hot. 
Where are we going to get it from? It's going to happen. We are there for the landscape and the birds and how to best save as much as we possibly can. We have to be realistic. We know we're not going to save everything. That's a hard pill to swallow, let me tell you something. But it's, a, it's reality. In trying to conserve the greater sage grouse, we have been able to touch over 150 other bird species, 83 species of fish, and I believe 90 plus mammals that also coexist in the sagebrush steppe ecosystem. And that was our whole point, is that it is not just about the sage grouse, that it's about an ecosystem. Okay. So getting back to water, we spent enough time in the uplands, I guess. We're taking this approach with our Western Rivers Initiative, <clears throat> looking at some potential focal species, willow flycatcher. <clears throat> we first look at, you know, the biology of the bird. What does it need? Where does it live? What are our limiting factors? And we look at the conservation status and the policies surrounding it. So even though willow flycatcher the more general species. It's a species of concern, but its little buddy further south is southwest willow flycatcher, which you'll see in Arizona and New Mexico, I think there's 500 breeding pair left, are endangered. So there's that lever, political lever again, and it also has the biology we need. So they kind of exist in the shrubby habitat strata of our riparian ecosystems. Next. Another one, the American Dipper, water oozel. Really cute. You ever see them on rocks? I go, hum, hum, hum. They, whoa. Is that loud enough for you, Joe? <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Um, I didn't touch it. Um, you know, they live in these high mountain streams. They are a really great indicator for water quality. They exist on um, insects in the water, and if the water's dirty, you ain't going to see them. They're not going to be there. So they're a great indicator species. Their conservation status is meh, marginal. They're not doing terrible, but they could use some help. And so from the idea of water quality, they are a great indicator species. And people like them. You've got to think about how people think. And they're just, people can identify with a water oozel or American dipper. Next. I'm so, oh, altitudinal migrant. Altitudinal. So water dippers are really in interesting, or American dippers are really interesting. They go up and down. They don't go north to south or east to west. They start high and come down in the wintertime, and then go back up the mountain in the summertime. So that's a really nice piece as well as far as when you're looking at it from a bio biological standpoint, how they use the riparian system throughout the year. Okay, Wilson's warbler. You see a lot of these guys, right? I see them in my backyard during migration. Um, they, you know, again, are a riparian obligate <clears throat> or a riparian, yeah, riparian obligate, um, just in different places during the year. They're more in the shrubby and the upper strata. And even though they're pretty common and they're, they're considered a least concerned species, again, they're ones that people see a lot. And we're looking at degradation because of their breeding habitat, which is us, which is the western United States, right? So this could be another or is another good focal species for us to focus in on. Now, in the riparian ecosystem, in the wetland ecosystem, there's, we were lucky with the sagebrush ecosystem. We could choose one bird. It just happened that way. You know, it's an obligate. It had the policy levers. It was in where we, everywhere where we wanted to be conserving. So it worked out. In the riparian ecosystems, it's so huge. And it's so diverse, both alt alt altitudinally. So as you go from a lowland riparian area to a high riparian area, very different. And very different birds inhabit all of those areas. So we have to go with a multi-species approach. Next. <clears throat> Along with our species, we look at places. Where do we want to focus? So I don't know if you guys know, there's something called an important bird area program in this state. Audubon has it. It's an Audubon important bird area program. We have 53 in this state. Shocking, 33 are tied to water, tied to rivers, tied to a wetland. 
fly, because that's where all our diversity is. So we're looking at these IBAs scattered across the state, too, of saying, okay, we have these focal species. Now, if we have money for restoration, where should we focus our efforts to get the biggest bang for our buck? So we can use the IBA program as well. Next. So what can you do? There's lots, lots and lots you can do. Citizen scientists, we have a huge program with that. You can do, get involved in monitoring, wetland restoration efforts, um, city cleanups around your river, river walkways and things like that. But one of the most important things you can do is become a member of RAN. And Abby Burke is going to be giving a presentation la later, also with Audubon, about our Western Rivers Action Network. But this is if you are interested in the policy side of things. Not necessarily, well, yes, the policy side of things. So <clears throat> our RAND network focuses on getting people out, getting people aware of what is going on. One, the Colorado Water Plan. What is going on about that? What can you do from your perspective to influence the Colorado River Water Plan? And I'm not going to do a spoiler of what Abby and probably Joe talked about, but as you know, non-consumptive uses are not well represented in our plan. We need them to be well represented. Why? Because it not only affects our wildlife and habitat, but eventually it's going to come right back and bite us in the butt because it's going to affect our health as well. So you can look at it any way you want. You can look at it from a wildlife perspective, or you can be, you know, selfish. I'm selfish. I have kids. I want them to have a future and a healthy future. This is partly why I do what I do anymore. Next. <coughs> Western Rivers Action Network, and actually Abby's going to be handing, she has postcards that you can write in um, the river that you care about. I know you care about them all. You can write in one. You can write all rivers. It's a postcard that we're going to send to Governor, hand deliver to Governor Higginluber. Once we get them all collected, we have a few hundred of them now. Um, <clears throat> and it says, you know, please, we care about our rivers, incorporated into the water plan. And at the bottom, you can become a member. And if you become a member of the uh, Western Rivers Action Network, you receive emails like, hey, this is coming up, and we need your voice on this type of thing. So Abby is going to talk a bit more about that. So with that, I'll end. This is our website. If you have any questions and, you know, midnight tonight, you're like, oh, I should have thought of this. Go to our Rockies website, which has all our contact information as well. You can always call the office. You can get in touch with Abby. Miss Joe is a a great advocate as well. So with that, I will end. And any, any other questions that you may have? Go ahead. <laughs> oh, that's a good question. <laughs> Um, well, Gunnison sage grouse, to begin with, there's um, about 5,000 birds left <coughs> across the landscape. Um, we have supported the listing wholeheartedly. Um, and they have delayed the listing, and I believe they'll delay it again until after the election. No one wants to touch that with a 10-foot pole right now, be pol politically. Um, <coughs> I think... Governor Hickenlooper is coming at it from, I want to be reelected, and he's trying to get everyone on his side. I think he's slightly forgotten about his environmental constituents. Just, just slight, slightly. Just slightly. A little sarcasm. Just a little bit. Um, and why I, I can't really figure out who his political advisors are on that. But anyway, neither here nor there. Um, I th what I believe is that <clears throat> with the greater sage grouse, and I think it'll push into Gunnison, Everyone is redoing resource management plans within the BLM and the Forest Service. Those are coming out. They, to be crass about it, they have to get their poop in a group. Not only Colorado, but we're talking Utah, Nevada, Idaho, and if they don't, the bird is going to be listed. So whether Governor Higginlooper wants to face this or not, he's going to. And we're going to help him. We like to say it this way. We are going to help him get there. Um, he is not, I guess, the environmentalist he has billed himself to be in the past, but he's going to have to get there or else his economic part of the state is going to go downhill. 
Uh, go ahead. Yes. Um, so it kind of is. It's gotten. You're right. A lot of them are man-made. There's a situation in San Luis Valley now with you know a man-made area that they actually want to dry up that supports a lot of sandhill cranes during their migration. So we've kind of made a pickle for ourselves as far as some of the man-made areas that um, are now very wildlife dependent that we have to think about how we want to manage into the future. And some of these, you know, when you're pumping water or making water go into an area that naturally didn't have water in the first place, it's a little rough, um, both ecologically and fiscally. I mean, it's expensive to pump water, as many of you know. So we weigh in on, on those issues as they come up, and, and it's a case-by-case -case basis. But yes, we do work with, and through the RAN, we work with a lot of farmers, or we plan to work with a lot of farmers. I have a proposal in partnering with another organization to work with um, 23 ranches and agriculture producers between here and Fort Collins. It's a farm to table program, but more importantly, it is about creating wildlife habitat on those ranches and in those agriculture areas. Absolutely. Right. Wholeheartedly agree with you. Yeah. Biological diversity, western watersheds, wild earth guardians. Um, we partner with other organizations on a very regular basis. Depending on the issue and what's at hand is, depends on our partners. Um, Western Resources Advocates we work a lot with, TNC we work a lot with. It just depends. It, no one organization, I think maybe this has been a downfall, quite frankly, of the environmental community, is we tend to alienate ourselves. We tend to kind of push back and say, well, we're doing it all. Everyone wants credit. But Audubon actually partners quite a bit. And again, it really just depends on the issue at hand and who we're going to partner with. I will say we're not a very litigious organization. It's not our bag. That's, you know, that's Wild Earth Guardian's deal. So we have a tendency to let them handle that part, and we work our policy through another way. And I think actually that works better for the environmental community so that you have different organizations coming at it from different angles. But yeah, we do, no one can do it by themselves, and they shouldn't do it by themselves. Go ahead. We are a grassroots organization for sure. Our base is, is a bit older, and we are trying to reach out to a younger set for sure. Um, <laughs> we need to. Um, how we go about it may be a little bit different than, you know, in our organization, in our grassroots efforts, we try and get people's voices heard, but we don't necessarily, you know, want them to go to jail and do things like that. It's more of a policy push as far as how they can comment, how they can influence their legislatures. No, we are not ones that are gonna stand on the Capitol steps and, and, and raise our fists and wave our signs. But we do work it from the back end a lot. We have 
unbelievable contacts within DOI, Department of Interior, on a very high level. And so what you might not see from Audubon is what we're doing through the back door to push and to move things. Sure. Um, there are a lot of monitoring efforts that have been going on for a long time, breeding bird surveys, things like that that you alluded to. Um, and each agency, state and federal, usually has their own list of priority species, birds, mammals, plants, reptiles, amphibs included. Um, there's a little problem with that in that, you know, each agency has their own there's some overlap, sometimes there isn't. What I really think needs to happen, and I see happening in the tiniest of increments, is our system, our um, environmental impact statement, um, environmental assessments, all those things that you, know, you can comment on and get public intake, uh, input. Um, they don't always use uh, the most up-to-date inventories, and one, um, it's because some of the inf inventories are not exactly available, and from a federal standpoint, how they access them it can be difficult. Um, so that needs to be improved. But I see the whole ESA, EA process changing a bit. And I hope it takes a big leap forward a little bit sooner than later, because the processes are very cumbersome. And like I said, there's a, you're right, there is a lot of information out there that really isn't that well used. But on a really big scale, I think we need to change the process by which those um, environmental impacts are actually assessed and start using the science that we need to, to use. Um, so many times, it's a wing and a prayer instead of using the hard science. That, that is available, because we do have a lot available doesn't exactly get to the heart of your question, but from a big landscape scale perspective, that's what's going on. So let's take one more question because we have to make way for the grocery store. Go ahead. You mentioned um, weeds and things that um, can't be filtered out by um, the, our food treatment system. Uh -huh. Audubon, our office, Audubon Rockies, is tracking that. We're not, you know, investigating and, and doing uh, the science work behind that, but we certainly do track it, and that's why I brought it up is, you know, people don't realize that even when you ingest medication, that the excess medication goes right through you and into the water system, birth control, things like that. So um, there is a lot of validity to that, and um, we track it, you know, watch the EPA and things like that. But... A good point that people don't realize, you think, oh, it's all just got washed away. Yeah. Not really. <laughs> it's there. Sure. Very, very right. Well, thank you. I appreciate all your uh, <laughs> questions. Mm -hmm.